I'm Maria Fusco, a Chancellor's Fellow in the School of Art in Edinburgh College of Art, and I'm with Jim Elkins, E.C. Chadbourne Professor in the Department of Art History, Theory and Criticism in School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Jim is our inaugural speaker in the Andrew Carnegie Lecture Series at the Edinburgh College of Art, which will be delivered annually over the next 10 years until 2024. Um, Jim, we're very happy to have you um, here today. I'd like to ask you a more general question about the influence and the sort of arc of your work. Um, your writing has been massively influential in delineating. Has it? Yes, it <laughs> Actually, has. Actually, there was. We were talking about the the yes. REF earlier. Yes. And how to measure influence. How to and measure like influence. That. We don't have to do that in the well, states. So we have no idea. I, I believe it I believe it to be massively influential in delineating the terms for discussion on methods of critical approach. Um, and that ranges across books such as What Painting Is, Stories of Art and What Photography Is. These somehow um, could be perceived as being non-linear interests um, and I'm personally interested in how you find your subject. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a big question. I'm, I'm, uh, I suppose I should say I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm still very puzzled about whatever coherence there might be in things that I've done. Um, I can certainly see differences and I can, I've certainly done an awful lot of schooling of myself in public, um, um, maybe in comparison to some other art historians. Uh, there are things that I would certainly like to take back um, and uh, books which have been reissued that I would certainly wish to have a preface longer than the book itself to excuse it and all the rest of that. And, <laughs> There was, a, there was a professor of mine at the University of Chicago, um, Joel Snyder, is a photography theorist, and he said at one point that uh, of his own most influential essay, I believe that I still hold to 40% of what's there, but uh, he wouldn't say which 40%. So. so with that kind of caveat, I would say something like this, that um, some of the work comes from outside of uh, theory broadly construed, by which I mean pretty much exactly painting practice, because I have an MFA, so once upon a time I was a painter, mm -hmm. And the sort of painter that I was, aside from just being a very bad painter, was, was the kind that sticks into the studio and sticks with the paint. And the, mm -hmm. the, the, the painting book, what painting is, is, is outside most discourse of, of, of art and uh, definitely outside of uh, most discourse of art history. It's, it's an ahistorical book. It's all about what paint might, how paint might mean outside of and before the painting is finished and mm -hmm. before history and all the rest of that. And that only connects by really tenuous threads to the current interest in materialism and materiality and things like that in, 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 in art. It really doesn't connect. I mean, it, it, it's seen to connect, but I don't think it really does. Um, I made the mistake in that book of using alchemy as a metaphor and, you know. So there's a fair amount of writing of that sort. And then uh, as a separate kind of a thing, I've also um, been interested in specific topics, especially science and art and various forms of interdisciplinarity. And recently, in the last number of years, especially interested in the ways that people talk about interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so although this didn't come up in our conversations uh, this morning, um, I think there are interesting distinctions to be made between interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, postdisciplinarity, subdisciplinarity, and metadisciplinarity. Um, these things really, I mean, although they're a laughing stock of people outside of academia, they really do need to be talked about because there's a huge amount of interest in that. Is there a necessity attached to, to your subjects? Well, um, another thing that I belatedly realized is that I'm not actually wedded to fine art. Mm. And uh, the very perspicacious Whitney Davis said to me this one time um, after some event at the, at the Tate, um, he said, you know, the thing about you is that you're not actually that interested in fine art. And this is true. Yeah. <laughs> but it takes a long time to realize that when you first you're a painter and then you're an art historian and so on. But um, I, I think it's true, and I've tried also to be uh, true to that uh, now that I've more or less realized it. And so it's not so much a matter of the necessity of the subject as the lack of necessity uh, for, of looking, uh, for looking at aesthetic objects. Um, and so uh, one of the projects that I'm still involved in now is tentatively called Our Visual World, and I'm uh, co-writing it with a German art, art historian, Erna Fiorentini. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a big Oxford Press book, and it's meant to compete with other kind of um, freshman or introductory level, you know, here's the visual world sorts of things. Mm -hmm. It's going to have much more science and engineering and non-art images in it than previous books have had. But not because, well, in my speaking for myself, not for Erna, but um, not because I feel that people should know more science, but just because I don't want to worry that distinction. 
Um, and so and that, that also doesn't mean that I, that I would ever want to find unexpected aesthetic content in science images. There's a whole lot, raft of reasons not to want to do that. Um, but I'm, I am actively interested in not paying attention to lines of demarcation that people have drawn between different aspects of the visual world. So um, our book is going to include things that are um, natural phenomena, clouds and things like that, and then mostly naturally as studied by scientists, but also as looked at by artists. And then it will, it, it will shift, hopefully, fingers crossed, seamlessly back and forth. And with every transition that seems problematic to a reader, will hopefully raise the question, why was I concerned by that? Why did it seem inappropriate to go from whatever, you know, portrait painting into a technique and then into a mode of seeing and then back into science? And so um, I, 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 think it would be, I think it's an interesting strategy to try actively not to worry things that are, that are um, you might say, pressure points for, for discourse. And in this case, um, it, there's an especially vexed point in between the aesthetic and the non-aesthetic. And I say especially vexed because I, I think of this in Freudian terms. It's, we have a phobia against, uh, against um, claiming that certain things are non-aesthetic. I mean, everyone, Jean-Luc Nancy, everybody teaches us that there is no such thing as a non-aesthetic object, or conversely, you don't want to say, you know. So we have a phobia about that line of demarcation. So um, the reason I, that I'm conjuring Freud there is because then in the theory of phobias, you transfer your phobia to something else and, and, and you, you, you hopefully you'll paper it over, you'll lose, you'll lose track of it. So I think that, it's, it, that the important thing to do is to try to identify what it is that's causing a rupture in the discourse and pretend that it doesn't exist. So we want to, we want to go back and forth in these, through these objects because from, from, from my point of view, what's, what's of interest is the articulation of seeing. And I think, to go back to your first question, um, if I were to propose one thing that's a sort of a core interest for me, um, I, I would, it would maybe be something like this, that there is an irreducible conflict between two different ways of thinking of seeing. In one way of thinking of it, you, you say you see the world better if you have words for things. Um, and so the more words, the more labels you can put in your imagination on everything in your visual field, the more you'll take them in and you'll realize what they were. So, in, in, the, in one of the stereotypic examples of that is kids from inner cities who are brought out to the, you know, the, out into the woods or the jungle, and um, they can't see anything because they don't have words for it. And later they have some words and they begin to see things. And, and I could give you more sophisticated examples, but you know, so semiotically speaking, there are labels for things and the things are in your consciousness and so on. I think there's an irreducible tension between the claim that's implicit in that, which is that your visual world needs to be present to you in language in order to be present as visuality, and an opposite or opposing um, um, fact, and that is that your words constitute an ideology, constitute a discourse, and prevent you from seeing things. So the more different words you have about, um, and of course words here is a synecdoche for any form of knowledge that you have about anything that you're seeing, the more that you have, the more you're within that discourse, the more difficult it is to see things that, you're not, that are not part of that. Um, so that tension is, is tremendously interesting to me because not only because it, it mobilizes a whole range of different theories in and around the way that the visual works, um, but also because in practice from moment to moment, um, you can see it working. You can see the, the pressure pushing one way and then the other way and then the other way. And then it's one of the things that makes seeing incomplete as far as I'm concerned. Your inaugural lecture tonight is entitled uh, Limits of the Discussion of Writing in Art History. Yeah, that's the title of the lecture. And uh, once upon a time, the lecture was about photography, and now photography is bracketed, and it's actually about limits of writing and art history. So, the way that this is going to work, um, in theory, is as a it's going to be the lecture is going to be in the form of brackets. Mm -hmm. On the outside of the brackets is going to be the question of writing, uh, because I'm, I'm very concerned with this in the humanities in general, and in art history, in and art theory, and art criticism in particular, um, that writing is hugely under-theorized. Mm -hmm. And the, the easiest way that I think to, to put this is that you have in universities um, a kind of a disciplinary a faculty to a divide between faculties. On the one side, there's the art world with all of its worry about jargon and its traditional ways of thinking about art speak and then within art history, all its traditional ways of helping students to make proper papers that will get published and get them out into the world and all the rest of that. And in that side, on that side of things, the theorization of writing is extremely simple and depends, as far as I'm concerned, on a kind of received, inaccurate version of Cicero's idea of the plain style. Mm -hmm. So that most of the time, most students 
will get advice along these lines. Make sure that your argument is clear, it's succinct, make sure that what you're claiming is necessary, make sure that you're moving you know, through in a linear fashion through your argument. And from that point of view, rhetoric is an ornament um, and it's something that can happen at the professional level. And um, some practitioners have made a career out of it, but that's not for you students yet, that sort of thing. And, or if you want to just jump ship and go into you know, criticism, then write the way you want and all the rest of that. All of that, the sum total of all of that is hugely impoverished in relation to what happens on the other side of the divide um, in the literature departments and the English departments and other language departments in the university, where literary criticism, this enormous rich discourse mm -hmm. from new criticism up through up to, you know, whoever you want to name, Paul DeMann or someone like that. Um, there's, there are huge resources there for understanding how writing works. There's an enormous, um, there's an enormous bibliography, uh, and there's a there's a great smorgasbord of different kinds of theories about what reading is that are absolutely unknown on the side of art history theory and criticism. And when they come across that, it's like if it's an osmotic divide or something, they lose almost everything. And what actually survives on our side, quote unquote is stuff like the plain style or just things like, well, you can be a good French post-structuralist writer. You can read, like, write like Anne and Six Sioux. You'll be wild and crazy and everyone will love you, but will you get a job? <laughs> you know, it, it's at that level. So this is my concern about writing in art history and the humanities in general. The way I make the distinction between the problem in art history and the humanities in general is that art history is, is supposedly um, that part of the humanities that knows how to write about and with images. So we supposedly have a better handle on how to do that and what, the, what an image does in a text and for a text and against a text and so on, and I don't think we do. So that question of the image um, uh, in, in the art historical writing leads me for myself to generalize this question and I'm now looking at um, novels with images like Sebald and things. And that's the other half of the bracket. So the lecture, what's outside the bracket is to begin with, experimental writing in art history. And after, at the other side of the bracket, it's this, I think, generalized form of the same issue. That is, how does writing get along with images when, it's not, when the images may not be art, when the writing may not be nonfiction, but still, it's the generalized issue. And that is the place where literary theory already is at play, although in a limited way in the, in the case of things like Sebald, but, but um, in a very extensive way in the case of novels that, that have um, evocations of images as opposed to actual images. So that's just to conjure what's outside the brackets. And then what's inside the brackets is the, 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 my own first attempt at this, and that is this uh, book on photography that I wrote, which, is, which was originally written against Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida for a number of reasons. One of them is that it's the most dramatically oversighted <laughs> <laughs> book on photography that still everyone's you know, go-to source for photography and so on. Um, but so my interest is partly to try to re-describe photography, in other words, a non-fiction purpose. But my other purpose, and the one that I want to emphasize in the talk, is that Roland Barthes, at the time that he wrote that, was very much involved in theorizing fiction. And he was, he was teaching a course uh, about reimagining the novel. He was working on this seminar, The Neutral. He had lots of ideas about how um, truth and fiction, you know, discourse and writing work in the world. And that, the, the problems that people find with the theoretical inconsistencies in Camera Lucida, I think, are directly attributable to, can only be attributed to, the author's own intention of letting writing go. He wanted to see what would happen if he would actually take writing seriously enough so that it might begin to undermine his own arguments and is indeed what happens in several places in that text in a demonstrable way. So in my experience, people haven't come to terms with these two different parts of Camera Lucida at the same time. The one part is what theories it has, to, what does it have to say about photography, and the other is what does it have to say about writing. Um, and I have a couple of examples in the lecture of each one's of one of those readings, but I don't think anyone has tried to do both at the same time. Because if you do, I think you're being, this is what I tried to do, I think that's more faithful to what he had in mind. He really wanted um, to try to problematize um, the very idea of making a claim about X, Y, Z, in this case, photography. Um, and so I think without, without taking that into account, the book is, you don't really fully read the book. So I suppose the third part of my intention here is to really, really read the book in a way that people haven't tried so much before. Um, there have been a number of 
many, many interesting individual readings, but I would, the, re the fact that the book survives and the fact that one of the reasons given for its survival is that it's supposedly written beautifully shows me how anemic the discourse of literary criticism is in the art world and how much more needs to be done to read like through that book or against that book and however you'd want to say that metaphor. Yes. Um, Bernard Schlink in the reader talks about um, uh, experimental writing as writing which experiments with the reader. Oh. And I'm just wondering how would you, you would define the experimental within your own work? Yeah, it's a difficult thing, experimental. Um, in the lecture, I'm going to use the word interesting. What counts as interesting writing? Um, because it defers the more difficult question of experimental. So uh, in the talk and, uh, and uh, in the project that I'm doing now, in interesting means within any given discipline, usually it's art history or art theory, um, I want to look at the texts which have been, which, where the writing has been remarked on by people in the discipline. Mm -hmm. So interesting just means marked for further investigation. It's not actually a concrete judgment, has no positive content, and as we all know in the art world, because people are always saying things are interesting. But it, if it's marked that way, then it's showing its writing in a certain way. It's demonstrating its writing, and it's asking for the writing to be responded to, and so people will mention it. And so interesting writing in art history theory and criticism is, is de facto experimental writing. But I, I defer using the word experimental because experimental writing in contemporary writing, in fiction and poetry, has different valences. And what counts as experimental depends on if you're reading Ulipo, then it's experimental in that way and so on. When I teach courses on this in Chicago, um, we go from interesting writing in art history out to experimental writing of different sorts. And the bridges are not not that clear, uh, not that, there aren't that many, um, there aren't that many cases of people who are actually interested in the art world and also interested in, in experimental writing. One of the ones I spend the most time with is uh, Chinese American writer Tan Lin, um, who's, you know him, who said, yes. he has all kinds of interesting things to say about what texts and images do, and, uh, and he is partly in the art world. I mean, he does, he's aware of the kind of thing. So you could, you could find these bridging figures, but in a way I think in the end it's probably not the right thing to do to look for bridging figures. So the idea of um, experimental writing includes all the people like Kenny Goldsmith who, <laughs> you always have to sigh when you mention yeah. Kenny Goldsmith, <laughs> <laughs> who, who among many other things is, is experimental in a certain direction for a certain purpose and yeah. it's not going to be, um, those purposes and those directions are not necessarily going to be the ones that people are going to want to follow when they're starting from writing about art and moving into something. They, they may be, but they may not be. So I divide this project of mine into two parts and interesting is the somewhat evasive word that I would use basically to, to find the examples that I think are worth looking at first. Hmm. And within your own writing, your own actual writing, <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that I say this correctly, writing with images mm -hmm. um, and live writing project. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about that? I like the use of the pill crew in it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, um. Yeah, so uh, the, the live writing project is something that I could talk about separately because it includes other things that are not things we've been talking about so far. Um, I have another book project called North Atlantic Art History, um, um, which I'm trying to write live. And I'm also writing this project about writing and images live. And what that means is that they're on different sites. Some are on blogs, some are on Google Drive. Um, and then the Google Drive documents are embedded live in my website. And then whenever there's something to read, I post it on Facebook or Twitter. And so the idea of that is not to wait until a final edited version, cleaned up version is there, but to, it, to expose the, the project when it's really, really raw and it's very, very sketchy. And what happens when it works well, I get a lot of responses and, and, uh, and the, I look immediately back to the text and if there's something I can add, I add it in and I thank the person. And then I go back on Facebook or Twitter and I say, I just add you into the text, check it, make sure you like it. So the, the books that I'm producing in this live writing fashion are full of unusual locutions. Like they'll say, parentheses, reading an earlier version of this draft, so-and-so, you know, suggested that, this and that. And the introductions to the books will explain that all of those interpolated things come from social media. Um, so they're kind of crowdsourced. Um, and so far I've found useful for two different things. There's for, in an obvious way, it's useful for finding references I've missed. That's, you know, that's not an especially interesting product of the social experiment, but the the, the part it's that good, I like it's is, an interesting product of collaboration, though. Isn't oh it? yeah, I mean it's I, you know it's great. I've, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, yeah. I've, I've I've now got a much longer list of novels that contain photographs than I thought yeah. I would ever <laughs> ever have. At any rate, um, 
But still, conceptually, it's, it's less interesting than the other product of, the, of crowdsourcing, and that is people are constantly reminding me of larger frames which I've forgotten because I'm focusing on smaller things. So people are constantly bringing me back and saying, well, but wait a minute, what about the graphic novel? And, you know, why are you bypassing this and that and the other thing? And so a lot of stuff is, is uh, a lot of the effect of it is not so much the coherence of the arguments, but the links between the arguments and things that weren't, that I hadn't been thinking of or that I've been deferring or that I thought I could successfully bracket out. Um, so many more links tend to be built that way. So that's the, the live writing project, and it, it's ongoing. Um, I intend to keep it up until the very last draft, and um, in relation to material that I've done on the artists with PhDs, the new edition of that book is crowdsourced as well and has huge numbers of editions from people um, who have thought of all sorts of things that I never would have thought of. The writing with images thing is, is, is different because, so the writing with images is the second part of this two-part venture. The first part is the interesting writing in art history. Um, and so writing with images is meant to say, the field of inquiry there is meant to be um, can, books that have continuous narrative, so I'm not interested in, in this sense, graphic novels or comics, they have to have continuous prose, which encounters actual images in the text, not just descriptions of images. And those, those images, those actual images, usually photographs, are meant to not have captions, and therefore also in the text no call outs, no see figure two, see figure three. Those are provisional, malleable criteria of this field of interest, but um, that would include most famously Sebald, but then also Breton and people like that. The notion, I don't know if it's really gonna work because I'm still you know, at it, but the notion is that the farther I go into doing detailed close readings of books of that sort, the more I'll be able to say whether or not uh, fiction writers have something to say to people who want to write about art because they've been using images in, the, the fiction writers have been using images in different ways. Um, so if there are connections to be made, I think that they might go backwards retroactively after looking at these. So, so in the lecture today, the, the, the notion in the first part of the lecture is to look at a couple of texts in art history that have been presented as art history and look at m in more detail than has been done before about how individual images work with the text. Do they exemplify it? Do they fight against it? Do they, you know, are they, are they interruptions? How do they work exactly? And how were they chosen exactly? And then the notion with the second half, the writing with images, to look at people like Sebald and do very slow, very close readings, obviously with the original edition, so you can see exactly how the images were meant to be placed. How much thought went into those images? How were they theorized? And how did the authors expect people to respond to them? In the case of um, Breton, for example, with Nadja, which is always one of the touchstones of this, I think those are very carelessly done. And the carelessness itself is almost incomprehensible. So in some of those images are very tightly knitted to the text. Details will go back and forth. Visual details are echoed in the text and so on, almost in a formalistic way. And, a formalized way. And then in other, other images, it seems like he went to a certain place where something supposedly happened with Nadja and he just snaps a picture and walks away. He doesn't even care how it's framed or anything. So why, what would be the conditions of that carelessness? That would be a, a kind of a close reading issue there. And that has resonance with the way that uh, people in the humanities deal with images. Because that, to take Nadja as the example, it's much more, um, various, variegated in its um, effects. I don't want to call them strategies because I think in many cases they're not intentional on Breton's part.